<laughs> All right. All right. Well, hello. Welcome to our family talk. We're so uh, so excited to be able to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Always uh, one of the, I think, favorite parts, at least for me, uh, favorite parts of our family celebrations over the years. And we've been doing these for many, many years, obviously, as part of the family celebration. It's a great time to uh, be able to uh, share some reflections that we have, uh, as well as to respond to questions. Um, many of you submitted questions through our social media platforms leading up to the family celebration event today. So, uh, so we have those questions, and uh, we'll try to answer uh, some of those questions for you, as well as maybe uh, talk about a few other things uh, along the way. So uh, first off, I want to start with Monse and welcome Monse Alvarado, your first yeah. time on the, on the panel with us. Thank you very much, Bob. So Monse, uh, you know, is definitely up to the quality of our panel, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as definitely dropped the average age of our panel, which is, which is good, too. So, uh, so we're happy to, happy to have you. Uh, obviously, you're no, um, you're no stranger to our EWTN mm. audience. You've been hosting uh, EWTN News in depth for a little over two years That's now. Right. Um, we had the crazy idea of trying to launch a show in the pandemic and mm -hmm. uh, actually made, made that happen. So, yes, um, yes. But you are new to the EWTN uh, employee family um, yes. and became president and chief operating officer of EWTN News back earlier, earlier this year. And so in that role, you oversee and lead EWTN's news efforts globally, all of our news shows, all of our news agencies, the National Catholic Register, all of the things that are a part of EWTN News. That's so, right. It's so very it's a big, a big portfolio. So we're happy to happy to have you uh, as part of the family uh, and part of our uh, family family talk today. So it's a privilege to be here. So let me ask you this: um, So your first memories of Mother Angelica uh, were as a child. Um, tell us a little bit about that and when you first became aware of Mother and your relationship with Mother. Uh, Although you never met her, mm -mm. Um, I know she's an important part of your, your own life and your own spirituality. Absolutely. You know, it's really interesting when you think about um, women in the church today and, and who we're supposed to be and how we're pulled in so many different directions. And you think of a nun and you don't think of Mother Angelica immediately. Everyone always thinks of school nuns. Mother Angelica was such a beautiful presence in my paternal grandmother's life. Um, my grandmother watched EWTN for Mass. And, and that was a reality for her day to day. And so that's what I remember. And she actually passed away a couple of months before we launched EWTN News In Depth. And she told me that in launching this show, I was carrying on her spiritual legacy. And my father then affirmed that a year later, um, that he also felt this way. And so it's, it's very personal. I feel mother in a very deep way. And also at the Beckett Fund, where I spent 14 years defending religious freedom at the Supreme Court, it was such a privilege to represent EWTN and mother who was still living at the time against the contraceptive mandate, this unfair mandate to fund abortion. Um, it was just, a, it was a ridiculous thing. And to see that win happen, um, it was just a trajectory where I had no clue what our Lord was doing in my life and how he was using you to convince me into doing some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> it took a little bit of convincing, but you know, that's okay, that's okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. No, and, and obviously um, in your role with, previous role with the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, you played a significant part in so many of the important religious liberty victories of the last many years in terms of the Obama mandates mm -hmm. for, for uh, abortion and, and health care and all of these things um, represented and was part of the team representing the Little Sisters of the Poor, yes. not just EWTN, but uh, the Green family and the Hobby Lobby case. I mean, right. so you had a, a, a pretty significant part of many of the, the religious liberty wins that so many of us uh, have celebrated over these, over these years. Um, yeah. And so you bring all of that uh, experience with you to EWTN, so. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the experience of fighting for the right to search for God and then being able to do something with that response, with what you find. And being at EWTN, I get to do something with what I found. Mm -hmm. and, and it's such, it's such a privilege, such an honor, and such a joy. It's transformed my prayer life, my faith life, in a way that I never could have imagined. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's great. So, Father Joseph, um, 
obviously Monse is you know kind of the newest the newest member of the team. Uh -oh. you're, you're sort of the the oldest <laughs> member of the team. Um, you can interpret that however you'd like. Um, Service wise. What I mean. Service wise. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we'll let that go. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, obviously we we're here today uh, in this family celebration, and we've we've centered this day really around the Eucharist and the mm -hmm. gift of the Eucharist. Um, the centrality of the Eucharist to Mother Angelica and her life, I, I talked a little bit about that in my opening mm -hmm. remarks this morning, but talk to us for a minute about the centrality, if you will, of, of the Eucharistic Mother's life and the life of the nuns, and then how that has sort of passed on to EWTN. Yes. So the theme is, I am the living bread, and that's what my talk up at the shrine yesterday was about. It's a living bread. And to think about mother entered a monastery devoted to adoration, and when she founded the new monastery in Irondale, she was adoring her Lord for 19 years, every day, before EWTN was even launched. Mm -hmm. And so that obviously is the heart was the heart of her life, continues to be the heart of our poor Claire's of perpetual adoration. And that's one of the great benefits we have, mm -hmm. is that we have a cloistered community of nuns who are praying for this mission. And I will send different updates that Doug will send, or Chris Wegemer sends, or that you send, to Mother Paschal, and she appreciates it because she puts it out there for the sisters to see the value of that prayer and that we've continued that. And so when Mother and the Sisters moved to Hansville, the employees got involved in carrying on the adoration. And 365 days a year, uh, although today we're adoring here <laughs> rather than Irondale, but basically 365 days a year there's adoration going on in that chapel. And I always say that's the heart of everything we do mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. the living bread. And the Lord inspired Mother to these works that seemed to be ridiculous, but it was a call. He inspired that in her, and he gave her the grace to carry it out. And uh, you think of all the different steps that she took, and it was in her time in adoration where those new inspirations came. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked on uh, Facebook, um, how many hours a day did Mother Angelica spend in adoration? Hmm. I'm not sure of the answer to that. I know she got up very early mm -hmm. because when our community first started, we initially, the first week, we actually prayed the divine office with the sisters on the cloistered side. We were on the public side. Mm -hmm. And I got there early one morning and Mother was already there, but she was praying on the public side toward that statue of Our Lady of Fatima hmm. that you often see in the public hmm. side. Mother was there, and she was praying to Our Lady in a particular way before she uh, went on to her other. But she would always work that into her day. That was where she would go for inspiration. And I told the charming story of Sister Veronica. So Sister Veronica was Mother's novice mistress and abbess up in Canton, Ohio and she later joined Mother and the Sisters. And when, we, when I first got there as an engineer, they would bring her in. She was in her 90s, and as soon as she crossed the threshold of the chapel, we knew she had come because she would sing, Oh, my Jesus, I love you so much. <laughs> she would sing to the Lord every time that she would come into the chapel, and that was just the fruit of her life of adoration. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, when I've been asked, Please. <clears throat> when I've been asked that question about how much time did Mother Angelica you know, spend in adoration, and, and uh, I guess my, my answer to it has typically been, well, Mother Angelica spent far more time in adoration every day than she ever did doing the work of EWTN. Mm -hmm. And it was because of that, because, because she spent much more of her day before our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, mm -hmm. that she was able to guide and to lead and to create and found EWTN um, as she did. And, and I think that that was always the secret of, you know, 
mother's uh, success with building EWTN was that dependence upon our Lord, the dependence upon mm -hmm. uh, his providence for all things. You know? Sitting as it, at his feet. Mm -hmm. And that's true for all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's the message I keep telling people is that he is there. And if we need light for the next step, we can find it there. Mm -hmm. If we need strength to continue the journey, we'll find it there. If we need a new fire of devotion in our heart, we'll experience mm -hmm. his presence. So that's the message that's really on my heart is just spend time before the Blessed Sacrament. Receive as often as you can mm -hmm. because it will change your life, but it will also give you direction right. in the work. Right, right. No, and, and so Doug, you've been part of EWTN for almost 30 years now, almost three decades. Um, and I mean, I think we see every day the, the not only is the chapel and, and is our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament the center of the campus in Irondale, Absolutely. Um, but employees participate in adoration throughout the day. Um, it's one of the, one of the, one of the benefits uh, of being an employee of EWTN Absolutely. is that you have the opportunity during your work day to go to the chapel to spend time in the chapel and, and to participate formally in the adoration program. Um, how have you seen that impact the lives of our employees over the years? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in so many ways, I mean, uh, just the feeling of EWTN. I think many people comment when they come, like guests, to visit or be on, and they just talk about the peacefulness mm -hmm. and, you know, just how calming it is and how revitalizing it is for them, mm. themselves. And I think in many ways, over the years, uh, we've got a really nice mix of veterans who've been loyal to the network and Mother yeah. Angelica, from, like Jody Copeland, who's directing this from the beginning, mm -hmm. and Phil Golden and other people at Fred, and a lot of young, wonderful people who people can see running around here today, committed Catholics, young people, uh, you know, standing up for the faith, want to do something for the Lord, and I think it's created really, um, thanks to your leadership and, and, and I think the emphasis on the devotional side of the faith and the importance of that, not only in our programming, which, you know, which is the number one focus mm -hmm. of the mass and, and the rosary and those kinds of things, but even among the employees and making sure that there's a, a noon mass that is dedicated basically mm -hmm. to the employees, that when there is a, a particular feast day, that there's a special mass that the employees can go to as well, and that, you know, uh, Father John Paul, you mm -hmm. know, uh, as a chaplain, you know, mm -hmm. will come around and meet with people or they announce Father Matthew or him will be, I've got, you know, we've got uh, confessions, you know, and they're regularly done for everybody who can come to the, mm -hmm. to, to the location, but for especially times put aside for the employees. And I think all of that ha has built really a, uh, a great team and a camaraderie that really is, uh, you know, focused on the Eucharist, as we say, everything spins around and comes out of that chapel. Right, right. I mean, the whole place is physically built that way, right. yeah. as Mother right. did, and, and, and as right. you have followed up, and everything does wellspring out of that and goes out. Right. And that's true in, in Washington. So Washington, D.C. is, of course, the headquarters of EWTN News now, mm -hmm. um, and that's been built out over the last several years. But um, even there now, uh, we've, we're in the process of a renovation, and and we've moved the chapel, uh, now that we have a little more space there, we've moved the chapel again to the center. Oh, wow. That's great. It, it mirrors exactly the situation in, in Irondale, um, so that when someone walks in the door of that, that news office, the first thing that will be in front of them hmm. is the chapel, right. and it's the center of that facility. And similarly, it's, a, it's uh, smaller than Irondale, but yes. uh, it has a smaller crew, but I, but I think similarly, there are masses, there are confessions. We have the friars and other priests who come in to say mass. Um, and, and employees have that opportunity to take that time, especially in a news cycle and in a newsroom, which can be pretty stressful and pretty mm -hmm. frenetic. Um, people have that opportunity to go to the chapel. I mean, how, how have you experienced that and, and how have you seen that in your time? It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see when people take that moment before a big meeting to stop yeah. in and make sure that they center themselves in Christ. Um, we call it just leaving that uh, chair open for Jesus to be there with us so that anything that we say, we know that we're saying it 
because he's there with us, mm -hmm. he's listening to us. And for us, especially during construction, when we don't have him present there, mm -hmm. um, Father John Paul took him and he's gonna mm -hmm. put him back once the chapel is done with the renovation. We feel the difference mm -hmm. and we know the difference and we pray through that difference, right. asking our Lord to come into our hearts so that we can continue that same kind of foundation and, and peace that you feel when you come um, to Irondale, but right. in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. in the same way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, is very special to me, I think something that we began maybe 20 years ago or so, um, every year on the anniversary, around the anniversary of EWTN's on-air launch on August 15th, um, we have a tradition of doing a Eucharistic blessing mm -hmm. of our facilities. And uh, so we just did that right. a couple of weeks ago. And so uh, we begin on the morning of August 15th with mm -hmm. mass to, to you know, celebrating the the anniversary of the launch. Um, but then uh, we process through the entirety of the facility mm -hmm. with the Blessed Sacrament, and we do benediction and devotions along the way. Right. And every, every inch of yes. those facilities, <laughs> we do. literally. We don't want any corners for the evil one. Yes, yes, yeah. We're gonna yeah. bless There's, everything. So. There is no room there, <laughs> no room right. there. Um, and we do that not just at the main facility, but we go to uh, we have a separate building that's the facilities building, and we go there. We go to religious catalog, and we go through the warehouse and the mm -hmm. fulfillment center. Mm -hmm. We go to the shortwave radio facility, and we bless right. that and do the procession through there. We do that now in D.C. as well, and, and it's very much a part of the, of the culture of EWTN mm -hmm. now. I'm very, I'm very proud that we've established that as a tradition. Right. Um, and, and that Eucharistic blessing, that, that Eucharistic-centered commemoration of our anniversary is something that now <clears throat> all of our offices all over the world participate mm -hmm. in and, and are a part of. And that's, I think, a beautiful thing, all of which is to say mm -hmm. that as just as for Mother Angelica, the Eucharist was the center of her life and, and of the community's life, that, that spiritual um, mm -hmm. legacy, legacy yes. she right. has, been, a legacy. has been continued mother. and passed on um, mm -hmm. to the next generations and through EWTN. So they had that beautiful Franciscan spirit, you know, that they incorporated really with all the employees when they were there on the campus of EWTN. Right. Mm -hmm. And we picked that up as well as their devotion to the Eucharist and to our Lord and just a personal, I, I mentioned this in the article I wrote for the Register, that they spoke to the Lord as if they knew and they loved him, you know, as a friend. Mm -hmm. It was something very real to them. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, something that they passed on as a legacy mm -hmm. for the employees and for mm -hmm. that place. And that's how I think God wanted it. He wanted it to be rooted in the spiritual life, that mother would give lessons every week to the employees. Mm -hmm. She wanted us to not just be workers, but that we couldn't carry on our work well without a deep mm -hmm. spiritual life. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So she actually taught us. And I remember the first book that when I got there, she was teaching on the Holy Spirit, her little mini book on the Holy Spirit. So that's the legacy they left us. That's how God, I believe, wanted it. It has to be rooted there if it's going to bear fruit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So one of the questions uh, that uh, uh, someone uh, sent in to us mm -hmm. was for, for Doug, which talked about uh, Father Spitzer's universe. Oh. So, okay. um, indicating, yeah. That's a good yeah. show. <laughs> um, so uh, our family member said, Father Spitzer's universe is one of my favorite shows on EWTN. The way you banter with Father Spitzer is hilarious and brilliant. <laughs> I don't know if they're referring to you or Father Spitzer. But, <laughs> um, how long have you known him, and how long has Father Spitzer been a part of EWTN? Yeah, well, I appreciate my wife sending that in. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll make sure I mention her name, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Terry, for thank sending, you, Terry, that. For sending <laughs> that, yeah. that wonderful question. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I guess we, uh, we, I knew Father, we know Father Spitzer about 20 years or so. Um, trying to remember it even longer. We were talking about the other day when, when we were, you know, we chat a lot in between on the breaks and then we, I saw him out of Napa when we mm -hmm. were out there mm -hmm. talking because we taped a live show out there as well. 
But, you know, the first time as far as dealing with him, uh, he came to do a, a book interview. He was on a live show and he had a book. And we did a book interview together. And for whatever reason, we just really clicked. Um, you know, he's got the same kind of goofy sense of humor that I do. We remember the same things. We laugh at the same things. We're both Civil War nuts and military history people. And so we have a lot of other conversations mm -hmm. about those kinds of things. And, uh, and uh, he's, 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 he's the nicest guy in the world. He's the most humble guy in the world, regardless of what he says on television. <laughs> he's incredibly <laughs> humble, and he's brilliant. I remember, I think the first book I got when he first came was one of them was like, it was his, his doctoral thesis on equating belief in the Eucharist with the theory of relativity. And I remember thinking, oh my Lord, <laughs> what am I going to do with this? I'm a TV guy from New York. <laughs> That's what? right. Hey, listen, you know, uh, exactly. Baseball, football, uh, you know, sports, I've done those things. But that was, uh, that was a big challenge. But it's turned out to be really good. And the idea was put forward about doing a program and, and we were able to do something. Uh, the original name of the show was going to be Faith and Reason Coast to Coast because we were going to kind of be mm. separate. Uh, but then uh, I think it was Steve Beaumont. He says he's not sure, but either he or the young fellow who used to be our producer said, well, what about, you know, something like Kevin's Father Spencer's Universe? Mm. And I heard that. I said, that's a much better name. That's we'll a great with that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we went with that. And it, believe it or not, it's about seven years. I think we just taped show number 365 or 366. Wow. Uh, Marcus Spursky, who's producing this event, uh, produces the show now. And uh, yeah, people seem to, to like it, and he seems to get some really positive feedback about it. And it's an incredible show. I mean, yeah. it's really been so, an incredible show, and the reaction so, is you know, it's great. So, yeah. 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 So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So knowing just how incredibly brilliant Father Spitzer is, <laughs> Um, and complete and total recall of, you know, virtually er anything he's ever heard, mm -hmm. <laughs> had read to him, right. or, you know, he will recall completely. Right. I mean, how challenging is that to be hosting a show with someone? That's not challenging at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Yes. I don't even, I, I don't view it as a challenge. I just okay. kind of, yeah. I do the best I can. No, it's amazing. He just kind of, he recalls information and statistics and, mm -hmm. and you know, he, he gives talks when he gives mm -hmm. talks and things like that. Joan, his assistant, when sometimes we talk about Joan, oh, yeah. I call her I Joan because she's like his iPhone. She yes, does everything yeah. for him. <laughs> and, uh, and she will actually read to him his talks or information. Like we were doing a spot the other day for promoting a particular program and she would read it to him twice and then he would knock it out, right. you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, he, he has an incredible and he does the same with mass. For he'll, yeah, he'll absolutely. Before mass right. and the sacristy, he'll have someone read him. Right, and then read him the the, the prayers and read him the, the right, and then readings he, and yeah, he, he as, simply he clearly is it. somebody with a totally photographic memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, he just yeah. remembers that, mm -hmm. and it's amazing because I always think of with him in some ways. I hope this is appropriate. I always thought here's Mother Angelica, the greatest spokesperson for the church, and her voice is silenced. Mm -hmm. And then you got Father Spitzer, who's an incredible visionary, and he loses his vision. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right, right. But yet they probably are more powerful today because of that in right. many yeah. ways right. Right. than right. without it. It's just the way the Lord works. Right, exactly. Yeah. So. No, exactly. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. It's really, yeah. really uh, quite extraordinary. The, um, so uh, let's see. So Father, let's see what Father Joseph. Uh, <laughs> I had uh, Terry send one in for you. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, okay. 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 Nice softball. Mm -hmm. So uh, our family member wrote in. Uh, <laughs> Father Joseph, you have a calming presence, mm. and I could listen to you all day. You speak with gentleness and confidence in God. Has that always been the case for you? I have a funny story about that. You know, I went to the Holy Land with Rhonda Shervin and Roy Schumann, two oh. Jewish people who entered the Catholic faith, and Rhonda and I became kind of friends during that time. And she called me her Valium, you know, because she's kind of <laughs> <laughs> she's a little bit str strong, a little, right, but yeah. she's a, just a delightful lady. Okay. But somebody asked me about that too, and I said, well, that was my grandpa Wolf. I, I knew him well. Mm -hmm. He had a soft voice. My dad had a soft voice. So I think it's just genetics. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully the Holy Spirit too. Absolutely. Instead of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, your turn. Uh-oh. Yeah. 
So our family uh, member wrote in and asked, Monse, what tips do you have for young people, especially young women, when it comes to career success, but focused on, focusing on your faith, things like time management, work-life balance, and all of these sorts of things? Oh gosh, I'm so horrible at all those things. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's a great question. You know, I ask that question all the time, um, and um, it's, uh, it's all about your prayer life. It's all about your prayer life. There's mm -hmm. nothing more important. If you get that right, everything else comes together. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we don't get, I think EWTN is an incredible resource for that. And I point a lot of people in that direction and trying to figure out exactly who are you in the church? Where is our Lord calling you? What does that look like as you structure your day to begin and end your day in prayer? That's to me the most important thing. Because you have to start. It's just a remarkable thing that we wake up every day and we can be alive, right? Mm -hmm. So you think there and you're like, okay, I got to be grateful there. And if you've got the lens of gratitude, everything else is our Lord accompanying you through that. And you have to then end your day thanking God for those same blessings, right? And then your perspective is correct. Because if you think about Instagram and social media and everything that we have going on in our lives, it's asking us to be a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be supermodel and spokesperson for social justice, as well as intellectual on whatever topic has just come <laughs> out. Everyone becomes an expert on whatever it is that just happened. Um, and rather than just being one thing, mm -hmm. our Lord calls us to be one thing, right? So I don't think about my career in terms of, or my job in terms of what it's going to do um, temporally for me. I think, of, is it going to get me to heaven? That's a very different question to ask. Is my job going to get me to heaven? Probably not. My relationship with Jesus Christ is going to get me to heaven. So is that going to help me? Is this helping my relationship with Christ or dividing me from that relationship? Mm -hmm. So if I'm thinking about all of my relationships in that way, if I'm thinking about that calling and who I'm supposed to be, right now I'm daughter first. Is it helping me be close to my family? So if you think about your career and your time from that perspective, am I managing everything from that prism, everything else falls into place. That's great. There you go. <laughs> So, uh, I guess Father Joseph will, um, this is a good uh, You're going to keep question. picking on him? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> he's the priest. He gets the, he gets the uh, tough ones. So. Um, so, our family member wrote in and said, Father Joseph, um, I struggle with feeling close to God, and the idea of going to Eucharistic adoration scares me. It's so quiet, and I cannot hear God. What do I do? Just show up. And those are words from Father Benedict Groeschel of Happy right. Memory. I, I, lo I love this, and I often give this as, a, as advice, actually, to people. Father Benedict said, you know, a lot of prayers just showing up. And what he is saying there is not that, you know, we're indifferent, we're not there with devotion and uh, you know, striving to live our prayer life intensely, but what he's saying is sometimes we don't. We don't feel anything. And Father Dubé of Happy Memory right, too, yeah. he talked about, you know, prayer is not just the consolations we receive, although those, those are wonderful and they help us to persevere, but it's also longing, thirsting, waiting. And so that would be my advice. Just go there. Mm -hmm. Wait, thirst. The Lord will speak to your heart. It's not always going to be silent, you know, that mm -hmm. he will speak to you. And one of the ways that we can pray, and Father uh, Bishop Sheen actually said, what do we do during the holy hour? He said, pretty much anything you want, you know, as far as what do I think, what am I drawn to today? It's helpful to maybe read a chapter of the Gospels, and something will strike us while we're reading that in the Lord's presence. Sometime maybe we're just too tired, but here I am, Lord. Yeah. with all my burdens, my worries, and I bring them to you, but I trust in your providence. Other times, maybe we're going to pray the rosary. So it's a variety of ways that we can spend that time in prayer. Do, do you think in some ways, too, in, in our, you know, frenetic, social media-driven, mm -hmm. you know, uh, smartphone-driven world, mm -hmm. um, we've, we've the culture has kind of created this fear of silence mm -hmm. in a way. 
Yeah. You know, that there's always got to be something happening. There's always got to be something going on. I've always got to be scrolling or, you know, doom yeah. scrolling or whatever. Uh, do you think that creates almost a fear of silence for people? Definitely. And I always remember Anna Maria Schmidt, too, another mm -hmm. friend yeah. of mothers in the past. That's true. And uh, she said, and she had been in a salt mine in Siberia, but through God's blessing, she was able to get out of that. But she was a deeply spiritual woman, and she said, God is a perfect gentleman. He never shouts over other voices. <laughs> and that's the need for silence, so that we can hear that still, small voice. Mm -hmm. And it's really, we can live in a psychologically unhealthy environment if we're constantly having noise and images and it's flashing, you know, that it's psychologically unhealthy. We need time just to kind of acquiesce all of that and take it in, reflect upon it. And, and so we do need those times of silence. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you my, my fear of silence moment. Um, several years ago, I had uh, the privilege of uh, being in Rome, as I'm, I'm often there, and of having a meeting with Cardinal Seurat when he had just published and released his book on silence. <laughs> And so, um, so we're sitting there in the cardinal's office, and and um, and he's and he's sharing with me his, you know, essentially the book, the book hadn't even been released yet on the market. Um, so he was just sort of sharing the idea of the book, and he was talking about the, the importance of silence and how we've lost the sense of silence in our world. And and in the middle of a sentence, he stopped talking. And. Um, he just sat there and looked at me. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, hmm. you know, and a minute goes by, you know, and I'm sort of, okay. Another minute goes by and, you know, we're kind of sitting there in silence and I'm thinking, you know, oh, okay, is he testing me on this? Is this what the, you know, what, what's going on here? And, you know, probably a, probably a good four minutes of sitting there in silence he continued the sentence where he wow. left off, you know, and I, and I thought I've, I've not forgotten that. But that was my moment of fear of silence because, <laughs> you know, was, I, I, you know, everything in me is saying you need to say something, you need to fill the void, and it's like, right. had I done that, I definitely would have failed the test. I would have definitely failed the test. So, you know, and EWTN Publishing probably never would have been able to publish his book. Right. So, you know, well, good. Um, the, uh, one of the other uh, questions that one of our, uh, our folks uh, submitted um, had to do with a, a project, television project, well, really a, a video project that we did earlier in the year uh, and released, James the Less, mm. Mm. Um, which uh, was really just an extraordinary uh, and, and incredibly popular, digitally viral uh, little series that we did. Can you tell us about that and that project and... and sure. uh, I'm happy to take all the credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> because the guy who did it was Steve Beaumont. Yeah. It was really Steve's idea. For the longest time, in fact, he used to always tell me about this parish called James the Less. I said, well, could they, bait, could they beat St. Thomas More in, in, in basketball, <laughs> yeah. you know? And I, we kept going like, well, what is this supposed to be? How is it going to work? And uh, he was persistent. And uh, with Peter Gangan and I, and we we finally green-lighted the idea of trying something mm -hmm. a, a little bit different, short form, that uh, could be web-oriented, uh, uh, episodic, with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, the kind of sort of a cliffhanger, which mm -hmm. I know some people think the cliff Yes, there's, was a, part, very there's big a part two of, like, <laughs> why did you leave us hanging here? Hanging. What's the, <laughs> come on. Well, it was one of these things where we, we said, well, you know, with like a lot of television things, when you're trying things new and you work in an environment like we do with limited funds and time, you say, well, let's try five episodes and see how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, and we weren't as clear as the story went along. It kind of takes its own, you know, a lot of times you write those kinds of stories, the characters lead you where they'd like to yeah. lead you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we didn't expect it to be quite as much of a cliffhanger. At the end of that, we thought it would have a little more closure, you know, at least Peter and I did. <laughs> uh, at the time, and so when it, when it kind of left off there, we, we agreed to go forward and to do more. Unfortunately, uh, you know, Steve is our operations guy and he has plenty of other things to do, so this is a project that he and Michael Masney and some of the other people were doing on the side, basically, 
and uh, they're working on the scripts. They didn't want to rush it. We originally were going to look to go into production in the fall. We're looking probably more like it in the spring, uh, but and really put some additional resources hopefully into it and, and have it refined. But it was uh, it was uh, what they called making a little bet. You try something a little different. You know, Mother Angelica would do that, mm. as we know all the time. Those kind of little I'll we'll move in this direction and see whether that's the way the Lord wants us to right. go. And if it's not, then we, we shift and go back. Mm -hmm. But it was, mm -hmm. it was really something we wanted to try. And we thought, you know, again, with the new technology and the new platforms, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the s stuff that's been announced about EW10 and more will be announced about those right. things in the right. future, mm -hmm. that kind of uh, in the digital domain, uh, it kind of fit into, and it was a way for us to kind of put our foot into, uh, you know, just dip our toe in, mm -hmm. in right. into doing stuff mm -hmm. like that and seeing whether that was the kind of programming that people were really interested in, and we were really, quite honestly, overwhelmed by the positive reactions we got. To yeah, it really, it really program. became, yeah. uh, you know, viral within the Catholic Absolutely. space when it rolled right. out, and and uh, you know, and so if people haven't seen it, um, definitely would encourage you, you to go check to it our, our on you know, EWTN mm -hmm. on demand, and and, uh, and, and we've watch got, it. Uh, we, we had, I know, it was translated into Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. the Vietnamese mm -hmm. people, they wanted to get it translated for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe Portuguese or at least one or two others where there's been inquiries about getting it translated because it really did hit for young people. It's mm -hmm. super funny. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah. So watch, if you haven't seen it, That's James right. Gilles, go looking right, for that. Exactly. Highly recommend that. Excellent. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Steve Beaumont. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, Someone asked a question, and, and it kind of dovetails into, in a way, the welcome this morning where, where I was, you know, talking about all of our friends from Canada who've joined us. Uh, our, that was an opportunity for the Canadian contingent there. Um, but we have so many people here who've come from all over the world, literally, to be a part of this, this celebration. Um, and it's a reflection of, I think, how much EWTN has grown over these years, particularly um, in the last 10 or so years where, where we've expanded exponentially oh, in, in many, many countries and uh, all over Europe and, uh, you know, really throughout the world. And, you know, you were talking about the, the, the James the Less mm -hmm. being translated and, and uh, our Vaticano program, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a news program that's produced out of the EWTN News Vatican Bureau. Um, is translated into, what, 13, 13, 13 14 languages mm -hmm. every single week. Um, and that airs on uh, not just our global networks that you would see here in the U.S. or the Canadian channel or the U.K. channel or our German channel, but it's airing on our regional affiliates uh, all over the world. And, and many people don't or may not know that, you know, EWTN actually has uh, partners that we work with in many countries around the world to create regional language versions of EWTN. So we have, for example, a, a Ukrainian version of EWTN that is based in Kiev. Um, that channel has, throughout the war, remained on the air miraculously. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, right. absolutely. Um, and we have a, we have a team of 12 co-workers there uh, who have stayed with that, who've, who've in the midst of the bombings and the, the rocket attacks and all of the things that have happened there throughout the course of, of the war, um, have kept that channel going. Uh, and it's really, it's really remarkable, it's really heroic work. Um, but we, we have channels in Poland, we have Hungary, we have uh, Sweden, we just launched on August 15th a new channel in Norway. So there is actually EWTN in Norwegian. Mm -hmm. uh, there's mm -hmm. EWTN in, uh, in Spain now, a new uh, in, uh, version mm -hmm. of EWTN for Spain. Uh, and we just announced uh, the launch that's coming up in the spring of EWTN Latvia. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll be a, a, a version of EWTN 24-7 in Latvian, um, had the opportunity to meet with the Archbishop of Riga, who's a wonderful, wonderful man who grew up in, in communism and in the Soviet Union and just remarkable, remarkable evangelist. Um, and it's a tiny country with a, with a 
you know, relatively small Catholic population. Um, but that is one of the things that we pursued is, is to make sure that um, wherever, wherever the need is in the world, EWTN can be there and that we can fill that need and we can work with these groups and people locally. And, and you know, that's all part of the, the growth of EWTN. It may not have been what Mother Angelica ever envisioned or thought <laughs> EWTN would be, but it's remarkable how right. through God's providence and the Holy Spirit, right. um, that's, that's so much of what EWTN has become. I just wanted to ask you, aren't you amazed, and it's true, that the most popular person program in all of these places is Mother Angelica? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I think, um, you know, we began, we began translating uh, Mother Angelica into Spanish originally, mm -hmm. and um, Mother was still active in producing right. shows. And, and I remember um, we would go by, I would, I would uh, often after we finished meetings, I would walk Mother back up to the monastery and, you know, get her through the, through the door back into mm -hmm. the cloister. And uh, we would walk by the translation booth, and she'd hear herself. <laughs> she'd hear them translating her, <laughs> and she would she would just chuckle at that, and she'd laugh, and she'd think, you know, and she'd always say, "That is just so strange to hear me." You know? <laughs> um, but you know, I always thought with mother, very colloquial, very American, mm -hmm. very you know, casual in her speech. And I thought, well, Spanish makes sense. That works, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then we started translating her into German. Mm -hmm. And I thought, there is no way that's going to work. And it did. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, into Korean, right. into Vietnamese, right. into, you know, uh, Polish. Hungarian, Polish, right. Ukrainian, all of these languages. She's trans and you're absolutely right. She has the same impact right. it's amazing. and the same reaction that people uh, have to her, right. whatever, tr whatever language she's translated into, whatever culture she's in. And I think it just speaks to the right. great gift and grace that right. she had, that God gave to her, to be able to just understand the human condition, to right. understand people and their mm -hmm. struggles, you know, and, and that was a great grace that God gave to her to be able to do that and to be able to communicate with people in such a way that regardless of where they are in the world, regardless of their circumstances, she could still have that right. same impact. So yeah. it's, it's, been, it's been remarkable. Right. I think she would, yeah. she would laugh about that, I know. She would, you know <laughs> That's awesome, I'm sure she'd say. <laughs> awesome. right. When we're, she was building the shrine, we were actually in Toledo, Spain, mm -hmm. and we're walking down the, the main street, and people were coming out of the marketplace. Madre Angelica, you know, oh. so, yeah. 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 so they recognized her and they loved her. So yeah. that was the experience wherever she traveled to. Yeah. And she no. transcends platforms too. I can't, I can't name the number of times that I've heard someone say, I went down the Mother Angelica rabbit hole on YouTube. <laughs> and, and I'm like, really? <laughs> and it just, this, this sure. experience of video after video oh, of right. things mm -hmm. that she would say and teachings, mm -hmm. and it's, yeah. just, it's just incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had somebody who said, yeah, I, I, spent, uh, I spent the weekend when, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, binge watching yeah. Mother Angelica. <laughs> and, you know, uh, that's great. great. That's great. Great use that's of great their time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> A far, far better use of their time <laughs> and those platforms than many of the other things. Yes. Yeah, so. Well, this has been great. It's been a wonderful uh, conversation. I hope uh, you found it to be uh, of interest. And